And welcome to tonight's uh, panel discussion, or book presentation, I should say. Uh, this has been a very whirlwind month here at the Institute, so uh, culminating this month with Oliver Bulo is a blessing. I just found the fact, this is the first time he is presenting to people from the Caucasus. So, writing about the book, going around the world, traveling countries, this is the first time, so I think he's a little nervous, he says here. So let's make him welcome. I'm going to read a little uh, overview here. The reason uh, this book is so important tonight for Circassians and the people of the Caucasus is, is that Circassians have been airbrushed out of existence by the Tsars, then by the Soviets, and now today by Putin's state. It is part historical travelogue and part journalistic reflection on the past and present day sufferings of the people of the Caucasus. His background, he graduated from Oxford University in 1999 and stayed seven years, I believe seven, in Russia and went back home to London and uh, was fed up. I think pretty much with the Caucasus, he was disturbed what he saw. However, uh, all the information he had, he had to put it on paper, and that's what this book is here. It's the culmination of him traveling to 12 countries and interviewing Circassians and people of the Caucasus for this book. Today, he is the Caucasus editor for the Institute of War and Peace Reporting. Uh, and I believe last night, yes he did, he won an award last night in New York City, that's what he's here for, for this particular book. And I found out just now as well, he's on the shortlist for the Orwell Prize, which is Britain's most prestigious prize for journalism, and that's for this book as well right here. So I'm now pleased here to uh, introduce Oliver Bulo. Hi, hi everyone. I am really nervous. <laughs> Normally I, I'm just talking to an audience of British people and I, I can say more or less whatever comes into my head. Now I've got a sort of audience of fact checkers. Um, uh, I, I was just um, talking to my friend Sabre who I came with, who's a former colleague, and, uh, and uh, she said to me, that these, these Circassians are great, they're so friendly. And um, I was like, oh, you know, why do you think I chose to write a book about them? And um, um, I, I thought um, I, might, I might talk today about that question. Why, why did I choose to write a book about, about you guys? I'm, I'm from Wales. I, I have absolutely no connection by, by blood or heritage to the Caucasus or, or, um, or to Russia. Um, and um, it sort of came about by, by a giant coincidence that I should get interested in, in, in your part of the world at all. And that was because in, in, in 2002, when I moved to Moscow, previously I'd lived in, in St. Petersburg and in Central Asia. Um, uh, a month after I got there uh, was the, as you probably, many of you probably remember, um, a group of Chechens took over the theatre in, in, in the centre of Moscow. This was a, I, I'd, until then I'd been a very sort of e a fairly happy-go-lucky, uh, easy-going sort of guy. I'd left university and, and, and more or less worked my way around the former Soviet Union in, 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 a, in a very light-hearted way. This was the first sort of major story I'd ever worked on and um, and and I became gripped by it and, and, and appalled by it and um, I didn't understand how in one country um, two, two nations could hate each other so much as, uh, as, as the Chechens and the Russians appeared to do and um, so I, 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 I started reading everything I could find about the Caucasus and, and, and hassling my editors to say you know let me let me go to the Caucasus let me let me go up you know um, at the time, writing about the Caucasus was, was the great job. It was what everyone wanted, yeah. um, because it was the most interesting, the most exciting. And you got, above all, you got to go to the Caucasus, because, I mean, Russia, is, Russia has, has many charms, but it's not necessarily a very friendly place to live. But, you know, going down to Nalchik or to Vladikov Kars or to Grozny was always, you know, it was a laugh. It was fun. People were friendly. Um, so I, 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 about six weeks or so after the, after the, the, the theater siege, I, I went down to... to um, actually to, to historic Circassia near Anapa to write about the Meshetian Turks who are one of the many nations who were punished by Stalin for their ethnicity. They were deported uh, from what is now Georgia to Central Asia and by a number of 
unfortunate and very cruel accidents. A lot of them ended up um, in, at that time in southern Russia, Krasnodar region, which is just about the worst place where they could have ended up because it coincided with a great upsurge in, in, in Russian nationalism and a lot of extreme uh, Russian nationalists who pretended to be Cossacks and spent their time persecuting anyone whose hair wasn't the same color as theirs or their nose wasn't the same shape. And, um, and I, I, these people's lives had been a sort of a litany of suffering um, for, well, the last 70 years or so. And, and I, I must say, I, was, I wasn't expecting to have a good time. It was going to be grim. And I went down for the weekend and, and I arrived in this house and I sat down and we all sat on, on the floor around the table. And, um, and I sort of waited for them to say something, really, because I was still very inexperienced. I didn't really know, you know, how, you know, how do you talk to people who are suffering or something you can't even imagine? And, um, and one of them said to me, um, you're a Christian, I imagine. Oh, this is, you know, this is a really bad start. I mean, I, I thought, you know, we don't really want to bring in the Muslim-Christian antagonism in, you know, and, and I was oh dear, well, you know, what do I say? I said, well, yes, I'm, you know, I, I suppose I am, but, you know, not, you know, not, not a firm one or anything. I mean, I don't have a problem with you guys. And, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and they said, well, you know, we're, we're Muslims. I said, yes, and, yes, I know, I know, I know that. And, and they said, of course, as, as Muslims, we, we don't drink. And I said, I know, I, I recognize that's true. And they said, well, um, as Christian, you, you probably do drink, don't you? And I said, yeah, yes. And they said, well, if you'd like a drink, that, that, that would be fine. I said, no, it's fine, you know, I can get by for a few days without drinking, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> and they said, a pause, and one of them said, um, if you wanted to drink, um, we as, as Caucasus people, our, our sense of hospitality is so huge that we would have to let you drink. And I said, no, no, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm not an alcoholic, I, I, I can get by without drinking. And no, They're no, forcing you to become Yeah, yeah they clearly, clearly thought I was some kind of advanced moron, because then they said, and if you were to want to drink, we would consider it very rude to make you drink alone. <laughs> and I, I, by this stage, even my dumb brain got around what they were wanting to say. So I said, oh, well, in that case, um, yes, I would very much like a drink. And out came the bottle of vodka from under the table. And, and we spent the next two days getting gloriously drunk and having an absolutely wonderful time. And this was my first introduction to how much fun it is to hang around with people from the Caucasus. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an entirely typical experience, but it was extremely enjoyable. And um, I, didn't, I did get a story out of it. I don't know if it was quite the story I was expecting to get. Um, but basically, uh, this, you know, cemented for me the, you know, fascination with the, with, with, with the country and the countries to the south of Russia and, and, the, and the regions in, in, in Russia's south. And, um, and then, um, so, I, you know, I fought harder and harder with my editors to make sure it was always me who got to go to the Caucasus, it was always me who got to go to Chechnya and, and to Dagestan and, and, and to Nalchik. And, and, um, and then I, um, again, a few, a few weeks later, I, I was doing a story about Chechen refugees in Ingushetia. And, um, and uh, I was talking to a woman who lived in a tent. Uh, the tent was about a sixth or an eighth the size of this room. And she lived in it with, with, with a dozen children about half of whom were hers, but half of whom had been, were her sisters, but her sister was dead, her husband was dead, her brother-in-law was dead. Uh, she had no source of income of any kind. She had 12 children to bring up in a muddy field in a tent. And she had just about the best sense of humor I've ever come across. And this demonstrated itself in the fact that in this tent in which she cooked on an open gas flame, they had nothing at all. Um, they had an enormous television. I mean, a television that was way bigger than the one I had in Moscow. Um, and, uh, and they didn't have any electricity, um, which is surprising. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I asked after a while, I felt we would got to know each other enough for me to ask why they had a, a television. It turned out an NGO had come to see them um, to ask what they needed. And you know, she would have done with a washing machine, a cooker, uh, a drying rack, a, a whole lot of things that you need when you're trying to keep 12 children clean and fed in, in, a, in a muddy field. And, but she hadn't been in, and the kids had been in. So the NGO came and they asked the kids what they wanted, and they wanted a television. So they had a television, and, and she thought this was just about the funniest thing she'd ever heard. Um, so I, you know, I left you know, um, this tent absolutely astonished. And then by one of those, um, so I've written about this in the book, so excuse me for all of you who've read the book, this, you know the story very well. I, I, um, I, I, I left the, the tent in sort of amazement at this wonderful woman. And, um, and, uh, and as I walked out the tent, the clouds opened, and there were the Caucasus. It was the first time I'd seen them. Um, the, cent the Central Caucasus range, you could see all the way across, you could see um, uh, Kazbiegi, um, all the way across to Elbrus, from far away, you could just see the loom of it on the horizon, and, uh, and I was absolutely smitten. So I spent, you know, the next 
four or five years. I spent as much time as I could in the Caucasus, a lot of time walking in Svaneti in Georgia. And at that time, it wasn't, well, it still isn't, sadly, safe enough to walk um, alone as a foreigner in the Russian, on the Russian half of the Caucasus, but I, you can, the Georgian half was fine. Um, I traveled, spent a lot of time in, in Vladikov cars. I had very good friends um, all the way up and down Dagestan in Chechnya and, and, um, and of course, all the way to Nalchik. Um, but uh, as, as you probably know from remembering what was in the news from the Caucasus in those years, it was it, the stories I was covering were sadly not happy stories. Um, it was suicide bombings and, and uh, Beslan, uh, a lot of death. And eventually I left Russia in 2006 and I had absolutely no intention of writing anything about the Caucasus ever again. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd loved the place, but, uh, but the events were too horrible. And, but uh, my cousin, uh, who's, who's my, my mum's cousin, uh, my uncle, he's very, uh, very, we're very close, he asked me to speak to a society that he's a member of and I couldn't refuse him. Um, so I went to speak to this society and I talked about you know, what I'd seen and what I'd done. And, um, and he uh, you know, um, sort of introduced me, I spoke, and then afterwards this old woman came up to me, and was very, sort of one of those tough old women who, you know, who really, you know, a lot of them in Russia, they get, get things done. And, um, and, uh, and she just said very simply, when are you writing a book? And I hadn't ever thought about writing a book before, but, um, but uh, you know, I started thinking about it. I started going to the library, the British Library, a lot um, to read about the Caucasus. And, um, you know, the way I did this is I typed Caucasus into the search engine, and anything that came up, I just went down the list. I just ordered book, book after book after book. And um, after about two or three weeks of doing this in my spare time, I came across a book about this place called Circassia. And um, I'd never heard of Circassia before. I, I, you know, I'd lived in Russia for seven years and I'd never heard of Circassia. And, uh, and I read about it and, and, and Circassia didn't seem to be located on the map anywhere where Circassians now live. And I couldn't really understand what was going on here. You know, these, they, they, you know, the, the Longworth and Bell, they, they were landing in, you know, Twapse and Gelenjik, and, and these, are, these are Russian towns, you know. I've been to them, I've been to Nov Novorossiysk, and these are, you know, they, there's, yeah, there may be some Armenians there, but other than that, they're just Russian towns. And, um, and I began to wonder, you know, what, what happened? You know, how did that, how is it possible that a whole nation that is, as recently as, as the 1830s, when British travelers wrote whole books about them, were there and vibrant, and, and they were the only people living there, how did it happen that suddenly they vanished? And, um, and uh, I, at this time I was very lucky to meet um, one of London's most active Circassians, Zayn al Beslane, who's a, who's a very good guy. And, and he, we sat down over, over a, a cup of coffee um, in central London near, near the, uh, the institute where, he, where he's, uh, he, was, he was studying. And, he, and he, he, he started telling me about it. And, you know, I... I you know, in, in Moscow, I considered myself a specialist on the Caucasus. I knew all about the Caucasus, and this was a genocide that I had never heard of, and I didn't know anyone else had ever heard of. And um, and so I set myself to, to learning about it. I read all the books I could find, which weren't, as you know, very many. And then um, and then I went travelling, and I started in Kosovo, and I met, you know, how many, a dozen Circassians that there are left in in, in Kosovo Circassian community. And then I went to Istanbul, and I met, I don't know, it's hard to tell in Istanbul, millions. Uh, and then, and then I went to Kaisli, and I went to Trabzon, and I went to Kefken, and I went to Ada Pazari and Dubje, and, and, and everything. And then I went to Israel, and then I went to Jordan, and and I had a, a really wonderful time. I I, I started off. I, I knew one Circassian, I knew Zainel, That was it, and that, but that was all I needed. So if you know one Circassian, they introduce you to another Circassian in the next town you're going, and then they tell you another Circassian, and then you go to them. And then you go to the next one, and and, um, and by the time I, I finished researching this, the, the, you know, the book in the Middle East, I had, um, you know, I had a network of friends in, in every town I could want to go to. Um, but but obviously, you know, the book wouldn't be complete unless I, I went to Circassia itself. So I took the boat across the Black Sea from Trabzon to Sochi. Um, uh, in in the in the accounts by the English travellers who, who visited Circassia in in, um, in the 1830s. You know, one of the, the great motifs of the books is always the, the amazing welcome. You know, they would come ashore in their ship and, and, you know, and there'd be guys on horses, you know, waiting for them and they'd be, you know, met and everything would be this riot of welcome, this, and, you know, this, this mad sort of magical party atmosphere and, and as they're made welcome and sat down and given, you know, food and drink and, and everyone comes to meet them and it all this sort of wonderful chaos. Uh, I didn't quite have that when I arrived in Sochi. Um, I, I got off the boat. Um, I was immediately detained um, by a fat man 
Um, uh, he looks very like a pig, actually. Um, uh, he, he didn't so much detain me as just take away my passport, which is a very effective method of detaining someone if ever you need a way of doing it, particularly in a country where if you don't have a passport with you at all times, you're, you're, you're liable to be arrested. So I and, 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 a, and a small and rather sad gaggle of Turkish men who had been stopped in a similar fashion, we were, we were led away to his office, where I was informed, um, after being made to wait for an hour and a half, um, that I had broken three Russian laws. One was that I had a business visa and I was in Sochi, which is a resort. Um, there was no conceivable reason why anyone would be in a holiday town with a business visa, so that was clearly... A, that was a, obviously a criminal offence. Um, I also, uh, my, the, the organisation that invited me was in Moscow and yet I wasn't in Moscow so that was obviously, obviously a criminal offence. I can't remember what the third one was but it was of a sort of equivalent level of seriousness. Um, uh, and I had to pay $200 uh, to get my passport back. Um, so I, I, I argued with him for a while but eventually I thought, well, there we are. So I gave him his $200 and I walked out and I thought, you know, what have you done to Circassia? You know, um, I was no riot of people welcoming me on the beach. There was a fat man in a uniform who made me pay $200 to go enter his country. And I, and I traveled up and down. Um, it, is, it is amazingly beautiful, um, as, as those of you who've been there know. The, 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 the mountains drop straight into the sea and the, the thickly wooded slopes of, of you know, massive profusion of, of, sort of tree life. But, but, um, but, but of the Circassians in, in, in Circassia, that part of Circassia, obviously not in, in Nalchik, but of that part of Circassia, there is almost no sign at all. Um, but I did, I did have, um, I, I obviously I needed to go to see Krasnaya Polyana, where the Olympics will be held. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I had a guide, very enthusiastic, who claimed to be a Cossack, but every Russian in that part of the world claims to be a Cossack, so I don't know whether it's true. Um, and, and he took me there, and he, he was a really nice guy, um, very friendly, very open. But, but talk, talk to him about Circassians and ask him why the Circassians didn't live there anymore. And he, and he, he changed completely. He became a, a, a bigot, in a word, which was a great shame because it's, it's very awkward when you're talking to someone who you like very much and then they turn out to be a bigot. Um, and he, he was talking, but you know, eventually I, I, I got bored of, of contradicting him because you know, that's no way to hold a conversation, really. And uh, so I just sat down and let his conversation wash over me and I was sitting under a tree. This was in Krasnopoliana. And I looked up and realised I was sitting under a pear tree. Um, it was in the, you know, if it had been growing in Britain, it would have been 200 years old. But thank you very much. But this was in the mountains, and presumably trees grow more slowly there. So who knows how old it was? But it definitely was planted by someone who liked pears, and um, and that person could only have been a Circassian. And so it, it was wonderful to know that no matter what you do um, and how hard you try to erase the traces of a people, something always remains. And um, I, I am delighted, absolutely delighted, uh, to have had this opportunity to come and, and, and talk to you all today. Um, you are one of the last Circassian communities that I hadn't yet visited. Sadly, I couldn't wangle New Jersey into an itinerary that started in Kosovo and ended in Jordan. Um, but I'm here now. I, 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 I visited 12 countries to research my book. That number is now 13. But it has not been an unlucky 13. It's been extremely lucky. I, as, as my friend Sabre says, and everyone's just so friendly. So, so thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And if anyone had any questions for me, I'd be very happy to answer them. Yes, um, please. I'd